And yet, he's praising Daniel's God. Now, back up a little bit. What has King Nebuchadnezzar already seen Daniel's God do? Well, in chapter 2, Daniel was the only one that would interpret the dream for him, right? And if you remember, there was a stipulation. Nebuchadnezzar calls all of his wise men in, and he says, I've had a dream, basically a nightmare to him. And he says, I want you to interpret the dream. And they're like, well, okay, what's the dream? And he won't tell them. He says, no, I'm not going to tell you the dream. If I tell you the dream, you can interpret it wrong. I want you to tell me the dream and the interpretation. Well, of course, they're like, uh, we can't do that. Like, you got to tell us what the dream is first. Well, so he puts out a death warrant on all of them. He's like, I'm going to kill you all. One of you better tell me what my dream is and the interpretation or you're all going to die. So Daniel and his friends find out about it and they go pray. And Daniel's like, God, if you'll give me the interpretation and the dream, I'll go and I'll, I'll tell Nebuchadnezzar and I will make sure that I attribute the glory to you. Well, God does, Right? So he gives, Nebuchadnezzar, he gives Daniel all the information about the dream. Daniel goes and says, okay, Nebuchadnezzar, I've got, your, I've got your interpretation for you. But let me be clear. It's only because I serve Yahweh. Yahweh has given me this interpretation. So right off the bat, Nebuchadnezzar has an experience with Daniel's God where he goes, oh, okay, that's interesting, right? Because this guy obviously can't cheat his way around this. I didn't tell him the dream. So he serves King Nebuchadnezzar well and tells him the dream. Well, what happened in chapter 3? Well, chapter three, you got Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego being thrown in the fiery furnace and not burning up. And Nebuchadnezzar's looking in the fiery furnace being like, who's the fourth dude? He looks like an angel, like a son of the gods. So again, he pulls them out. They don't smell like smoke. They're not singed at all. And again, he's experiencing, okay, this God has real power and I've seen it up close and personal. So something is happening with Nebuchadnezzar where he's experiencing an up-close and personal thing with God, and he's praising him. He's giving him due credit. Well, let's see if it sticks. So he has the dream. I'm going to read the dream to you because here's the deal. I want to teach you about this name tonight. I'm just using this story, but we're not digging into this story. So I'm not going to unpack all the details from chapter 4. I just want to use it as a launching point to show you what Nebuchadnezzar is learning about God, right? So he has the dream. This is the dream, okay? It says, the visions of my head as I lay in bed were these. I saw, behold, a great tree in the midst of the earth, and its height was great. The tree grew and became strong, and its top reached to heaven. It was visible to the end of the whole earth. Its leaves were beautiful, fruit abundant, and it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it, and the birds of the heaven lived in its branches. All flesh was fed from it. I saw in the visions of my head as I lay in bed, and behold, a watcher, a holy one, came down from heaven. He proclaimed aloud and thus said, chop down the tree and lop off its branches, strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the beasts flee from under it and the birds from its branches. But leave the stump of its root in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze amid the tender grass of the field. Let him be wet with the dew of heaven. Let his portion be with the beasts and the grass of the earth. Let his mind be changed from a man's and let a beast's mind be given to him. And let seven periods of time pass over him. The sentence is by the decree of the watchers. The decision by the word of the holy ones to the end that the living may know that the most high rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will and sets over it the lowliest of men. So that's his dream. Big, beautiful tree gives shade and fruit to everything, and everything seems to be going really well when all of a sudden a voice comes from heaven and says, chop it down. Get rid of it. Make it like a stump. Put a band of iron and bronze around it. Let seven periods of time pass. And here's the thing. When you read scripture, read with critical eyes because if you notice in the middle of that dream, the watcher starts talking about the tree, right? It, this, that, and then look at this. In verse 16, what happens? It says, let his mind be changed. It's really important to notice pronouns because obviously this watcher has just revealed the metaphor of the tree as a man, right? So here comes Daniel and he actually knows the interpretation. And what's interesting, he is anxious by the dream. In fact, it says he's appalled by the interpretation because he knows what's about to happen. So let me read the interpretation. This is what he has to tell 
a Babylonian king who has wiped out his country and has the ability to kill anybody that he doesn't like what you say at any moment. Keep that in mind. That context is really important because Daniel trusts God but is in a precarious situation. But this is what he says. In verse 20, the tree you saw which grew and became strong so that its top reached the heaven and it was visible to the end of the whole earth whose leaves were beautiful and its fruit abundant and in which was food for all and under the beasts of the field found shade. It was you, O king, you have grown and become strong. Your greatness has grown and reaches to heaven and your dominion to the ends of the earth. And because the king saw a watcher, a holy one coming down from heaven and saying, chop down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stump bound with a band of iron and bronze in it. In the tender grass of the field, let him be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts of the field till seven periods of time pass over him. This is the interpretation, O king. It is a decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord the king, that you shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. You shall be made to eat grass like an ox, and you shall be wet with the dew of heaven, and seven periods of time shall pass over you, till you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. And it was commanded. And interestingly enough, down in verse 27, Daniel says, Therefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by practicing righteousness and your iniquities by showing mercy to the oppressed, that there may perhaps be a lengthening of your prosperity. Did you notice the difference there? This is going to happen. He's not telling him, Break off from your sins and maybe God will change his course. No, the course is set. You were given a dream. This is written. This is going to happen to you. But, you know, if you change your ways and you repent and you start doing the right things, maybe God will give you more time before this happens. How sweet of Daniel. (laughs) Trying to protect Nebuchadnezzar, right? Well, Nebuchadnezzar doesn't listen. And 12 months later, he's up on his balcony. And this is actually, I mean, I I can't, I kind of chuckle just because, I don't know, it just makes me laugh. It's power makes people hungry, right? Power's hard. It's hard to be humble if you're that kind of power. I mean, at that time, Babylon, if you look at maps and you kind of look at world empire powers at that time, like Babylon stretched far and wide over the whole thing. He had conquered pretty much everything, right? And his dad, Nabopolassar, before him, he had conquered. Like they, they pretty much reigned the whole area, right? He's king over all of the Middle East. He's got a lot of power. So 12 months later, he's on his balcony praising himself for being so super dynamite awesome. And this is what happens. A voice comes from heaven and said this, verse 31, while the words were still in the king's mouth, There fell a voice from heaven, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you, and you shall be driven from among men. Your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. You shall be made to eat grass like an ox, and seven periods of time shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. You know, interestingly enough, this is one of the things I love that we do teach our kids. The idea of Christianity... There is definitely faith involved. We're not going to be given all the answers perfectly black and white so that you can know for sure 100%. That's what faith is, right? Faith means we're not going to give all the answers. However, archaeology is is pretty awesome, right? So for a long time in the Babylonian cylinders, so they had these big cylinders and they would carve like their history in them, right? They didn't understand why there was a gap in time in historical records of Nebuchadnezzar's rule. There's a seven-year gap where there's nothing recorded. No meetings, no advancing, no strategy, no community meet. Like, there's nothing. Nobody's coming into Babylon and having these big parties. Nothing. There's nothing recorded for seven years. There's a gap. So literally, if you want to look at that, you can interpret that according to biblical standards. We know. Like, we know why there's a gap. Because God, Yahweh, was doing something with a Babylonian king. He was teaching him a lesson. Nebuchadnezzar, in his own mind, even though in the beginning he's praising God and being like, oh, your dominion rules everlasting, 12 months later, he's up going, my dominion's everlasting. Nobody can defeat me. And that's probably truly how he felt. Right At that point, he thought he'd reached the end. He'd checked off every box. 
And God's like, ah, let me show you. Let me show you who gave you your position. And I'm just going to back up a little bit. I want to show you one thing. Because this is, again, it's important to read with critical eyes. Opening verse in Daniel chapter 1, it says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, that's the southern kingdom, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. God raised up Babylon. Because sin is serious in God's eyes. And his people were doing wicked atrocities. And so he brings up a foreign country raises that kingdom up and puts in Nebuchadnezzar's mind to attack Israel. Do you follow the history of Israel over the whole entire time? How many people have tried to wipe Israel out? Isn't that interesting? God's people, and yet all these dictators over time, keep trying to come and wipe out, and God's like got this protection because he's doing something he's not done. But in this case, it's God who's bringing them. God's bringing Babylon. God's putting it into King Nebuchadnezzar's mind to go and punish his people so that they'll repent, not to destroy them, so that they'll repent. But God's got a purpose. And the name that we see throughout all of chapter four and even in chapter one is this name Most High. So this is a banner. God's doing something specific about this aspect of his character. And so at the, what happens is he goes through seven periods of time. That's, that's what history tells us. And according to the story, I mean, he lives out in the field. He's wet with dew. He's eating grass. Some, some people say maybe it's mad cow disease. I don't actually know if there's like a real physical thing that went with it. Either way, he didn't have a good life for seven years, okay? But at the end of it, we come to the end, and it says in verse 34, at the end of the days, so at the end of the seven periods of time, this is now Nebuchadnezzar's response. I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my reason returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion. And his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. And he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. None can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time, my reason returned to me, and for the glory of my kingdom, my majesty and splendor returned to me. My counselors and my lords sought me out, and I was established in my kingdom, and still more greatness was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, for all his works are right, and his ways are just, and those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. I love this story because it's smack in the middle of Israel's history. You've even got record, Nebuchadnezzar's writings are included in Daniel's book. And Daniel is influential in the Babylonian kingdom, influential. We have no idea the stretch and reach that Daniel had. And I, I always try to like paint that picture for my kids. I want you to just think about what Daniel went through, right? If we really, truly just dig into history about Daniel, like he was probably young, anywhere from 12 to 14, 15 years old, right? Captured probably saw his parents killed because they're the elite, the wealthy, and they, they killed all of them because they didn't want anybody to try to have a kid or a grandkid that could come up and claim the throne. So they got rid of all the rich and elite. That was just common practice when you took over a country, right? So most likely his parents were killed. We don't know if they were killed near him or where he was when this happened. When he's taken back, most likely they're made to be eunuchs because they don't want testosterone to come in and have any kind of issue with the king, with being in close proximity with the king. They want to try to, they thought they could control it like that. So maybe he's made into a eunuch and he's serving the very king who destroyed his homeland, who has enslaved his people and killed thousands of people, not to mention what he did to other countries beyond Israel. And Daniel's response is pretty much, I mean, we don't really see any moment, it's not recorded, and based on Daniel's character, it, it seems like he didn't have it, but we don't see any moment of pity party or whining or crying, like he just was like, this is an opportunity to bring glory to God. So he stepped into a role 
I don't know when he was able to grieve or process all the things that happened, but he had such a foundational understanding of the character of God that when the worst possible thing happened to him, he was still able to respond and look at it as an opportunity. And by the way, after Nebuchadnezzar, the Persians come in and conquer the Babylonians, and then Israel gets passed to the Persians, right? And I don't know how long it took, but almost immediately, Daniel's in good favor with King Darius. And now he's got a relationship with the Persian king. And he's, remember the, Daniel in the lion's den? That's the Persian king who's bending over the thing going, oh my goodness, Daniel, did you survive the night? I'm sorry, did your God save you? I prayed to your God that he saved you. A Persian king praying to Yahweh that he would save Daniel. That's the kind of influence Daniel had on this country. That's amazing. I honestly, I, I'm, I'm not ashamed at all to say, I don't know that I could have done that. Had that kind of response. I mean, and, and I've even talked to my kids about this, like, what would you do? Can you imagine? It's just crazy, the kind of response he had. And all along the way, throughout this story, God is operating under the banner of Most High. Man, he wants Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel, really, to know something about him. So let's break it down from what Nebuchadnezzar said. Here's what we can learn. What did Nebuchadnezzar learn about Most High? Well, number one, God's dominion or authority and his kingdom are eternal. What we see going on around us, that is only because God either positions it or allows it like that. God's dominion covers all, and it's eternal. He has never, ever given up his authority. He does as he pleases with the power of heaven and the people of earth. Can't tell you how many times in the Bible that God says, I'm the potter, you're the clay. I shape you the way I want you to be. It doesn't mean God's gonna do anything mean or bad. He's a just, good God. We're talking about authority here. We're talking about God's authority as the most high. He's perfect. He's never gonna do anything wrong. Nebuchadnezzar also learned that no one can hold back his hand. Man, did he learn that? Seven years in a horrible state, Nebuchadnezzar learned it. He was humbled completely. It says, no one can even say to God, what have you done? Now, that's not to mean that when we cry out because we don't understand that that's, we can't do that. We can do that. The point is, we can't stand as equals and say to God, what have you done? We can cry out in our ignorance. We, in, we can cry out in our frustration and in our confusion, but we should always cry out from a posture of, I know that I don't understand you, and I know you're the most high. I'm just confused. We never get to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with God and go, what have you done? In other words, we don't stand in judgment. We have no right. And by the way, I love the story of Job. Job kind of tries to do that. He kind of tries to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with God. And he asks God so many questions. And you know, if you read Job, God never answers a single question Job asked. Not once. He simply says, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Who are you to speak to me? You who can't do any, like he simply puts Job in his place. I don't have to answer your questions. I'm God, you're not, you've forgotten that. And at the end of the book, after Job's mind has been blown wide open and he has just been presented up close and personal with the majesty and awe of who God really is, the most high God, he just goes, ah, I repent in dust and ashes. I had heard of you, but now I know you. Now I see you for who you are. That's the whole point. We don't have a right to stand in judgment of God. We can express confusion, but we have to be aware of our posture. That's why God is saying, I'm the most high. And last, he finishes his thoughts, King Nebuchadnezzar, by saying, everything the king of heaven does is right and his ways are just. He's able to humble those who walk in pride. After seven years, he got it. He got it. So this name in the English Most High, it comes from really Aramaic, by the way. Half of Daniel's written in Aramaic. But it's got some Aramaic roots. But in the Hebrew, the word Elyon, it's referring to something that goes up or ascends, okay? And in every case, it's used to describe that which is highest or, or that which is utmost. So obviously, when you combine that with God's name, it's stressing the highest supremacy of God. It's really making 
a very clear distinguishment in who God is versus who we are. What God's dominion is versus the fact that we don't have dominion. It's, it's making a distinction. It shows us that God is sovereign. Big word, but if you look in the middle of that word, it means it, you see the word reign. That's what it means. It means that God reigns and rules over everything. It's, it's all his. He's the creator. It's his right. Man, today when I hear people either making fun of God or, you know, talking about the way that God does certain things and then making fun of that, like what God, I just think to myself, oh, one day you're going to regret that. Like we have no fear of God anymore. We have no reverence. And I think the fear of the Lord is actually a, a positive thing. I'm not saying like in our relationship we should be quivering in a closet afraid God's going to smite us. We don't know God then. But we should have a healthy fear of God's power and the fact that he is in control. And that's actually a good thing. When the two names are combined, El and Elyon, it can literally be translated the extremely exalted sovereign high God. It's a mouthful. One example is Psalm 57 2. It says, I will cry to God most high, to God who accomplishes all things for me. So if you look at the words in that, the names, it's I will cry out to Elohim, El Elyon, to El who accomplishes all things for me. Three names for the price of one. It's interesting to think about the transformation that Nebuchadnezzar went through to watch him be humbled by El Elyon who wanted him to know him as El Elyon. God, there's, guys, there's a reason that God uses Adonai and El Shaddai with Abraham and uses El Elyon with Nebuchadnezzar. What he's teaching Abraham is something different about his personality and his characteristic, his nature. But with, with Nebuchadnezzar, he's humbling him. So he's using El Elyon. Don't confuse me. I'm El Elyon. So there's a really big thing I want to teach you tonight. Some Big theological words with a really simple concept. But this is important because I believe this, is, this gets at the heart of this name. And this is important with how we worship God today, okay? So it's this concept, the transcendence versus the imminence of God. Big words that just mean that God is both far removed from us and very near to us at the same exact time. So unlike the concept of little g-gods in other religious systems... God is a balance of both. If you think about the gods of Egypt, if you've learned anything about the gods of Egypt, you learn they were very cruel and demanding. There was no relationship. You didn't have a relationship with Ra, the sun god. You simply acquiesced to his demands and kept him at bay and kept his wrath away from you. So he was cruel and he was transcendent in their minds. Don't hear me say they're real. My point is, in that system, those little g-gods were only ever transcendent. All power, all cruel, all tyrant, all punishment, all wrath, no love, no mercy, no nearness. We don't ever hear stories in any religion of like a Babylonian god being coming close and being like, I, I want to know you personally. I want to show you mercy. It was never mercy. It was just punishment. Christianity is set apart with every other religion for that very purpose. We have a God who basically, under that banner of his name, Yahweh, in the beginning, the great I am, says, I'm Yahweh, the most majestic, the great I am, and yet, I want to be in covenant with you. I want to be intimately close to you because I created you and I know every detail about you. That's unusual. So this idea of transcendence is creating a balance. So we know that God is fully holy, yet he's approachable. He makes it that way. He's full of wrath, yet he's loving and merciful. He's greatly to be feared, yet he's kind and he's faithful. So we have this dichotomy, and what happens is today, people try to separate that into the wrathful God of the Old Testament and the sweet little Jesus, the meek and mild shepherd who loved sheep and children. That's what we do, when in reality... Both hold all the same attributes and tension all at the same time. We've got to quit splitting God up. We've got to start worshiping the totality of who God is at all times. So God is transcendent. That means he's wholly other. He's not just quantitatively different and greater. He's qualitatively different, meaning if we're toy matchbox, car, matchbox cars, he's not a bigger car He's a galaxy. 
He's qualitatively other than what we are, right? Completely above, all sufficient. He's distinct. He's perfectly holy. He doesn't need anything. He's not a needy God. He's not up in heaven being like, I wish that person would choose me. He doesn't need anything. He chooses to engage and be faithful and bind himself to us because of his love. But he's completely self-existent and self-sufficient. The Trinity alone has perfect union, glory, and happiness with just three of them. They chose to engage with us, not because they needed it, but because it's in their character, because they are love. He's infinitely beyond anything we can even imagine. He's distinct, set apart. He's just not like us, right? He's just so, so different, transcendent. He's that far above. So common words like the scriptures to think about God's transcendence, that aspect of his nature are majestic, sovereign, almighty, just, wrathful, holy, all-knowing. These are the big ones, the dynamic, the powerful that set him apart. He's our ruler, our king, our master, our judge. That's his transcendence. So a couple of verses that might help you kind of connect to that, Isaiah 55 He says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord, declares Yahweh. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. I mean, there's going to be some things that we do not understand about what God does. There's going to be times when we don't get it. God, I don't know why you chose to do that. And how we respond in that is really important. Because having a posture of I don't know, but I trust that you're good. And I hold that tension because I can't know. That's a good posture to be at. I don't understand, but that's okay. Because if you truly could understand and explain everything about God, would he be worthy of your worship? He's God. He's supposed to be that much far above us. But, but here's the cool thing. He's also imminent. So he's near, and he chooses to be close to us. So the idea of of imminence is he's present and active in nature, in history, and in our lives because of his love. If you think about the Bible from big picture view, God is constantly going and connecting with people, with Adam and Eve, with Noah, with Abraham, with Isaac, with Jacob, with Joseph, with Israel, with Moses. God is a personal God who wants to connect. Later on, Abraham is referred to as a friend of God. Who in here wouldn't love to think of ourselves as a friend of God? That's why he's distinct from the little G gods because he's super powerful, yes, and dynamic and do anything he wants, and yet he's like, I want to be with you. I I don't have to choose. I'm both. The best example of this is the incarnation, of course, right? So Jesus becoming one of us, that is, in essence, God's eminence. The idea of being near to us. Jesus literally takes on flesh and comes to us, separates the gap. Praise the Lord that he didn't say, you get yourself cleaned up, You get yourself put together, you start doing it right, and then we'll talk. While we were yet sinners, Christ died. He he measures the gap. He comes because he desires to be near us to the point where he's willing to lay down his life. His work on the cross, along with the resurrection, shows us the efforts, the great efforts that God took to restore the relationship to himself. See, our sin magnified his transcendence. But when we repent, we actually enable a new and deeper imminence because we can actually have God in us, not just near us. And remember, and this is so hard for my little brain to get, but when Jesus is leaving, he says to them, it's better that I go. It's better. And they couldn't imagine it. What could be better than having you right here with us? And he's like, just trust me. It's better that I go. And then they get the Holy Spirit and look at what they were able to do. And we have that same power within us. So 
So common words you might hear that remind you of God's imminence are loving, merciful, graceful, forgiving, compassionate. He is our father, our shepherd, our redeemer, our rescuer, and our comfort. Do you see the difference? These are very, these are stark, right? The transcendent qualities are all very power, and they seem, they seem hard to grasp at times. And then the imminent side is like, I love Jesus as shepherd. I love mercy. I love grace. I love compassion. Those are easy for me to worship. And this is my main goal tonight. I want you to really dig deep and go, am I leaning one way and finding it difficult to worship the other? Because we should be able to worship God as the wrathful, holy judge the same way that we worship Jesus, our Redeemer. And if we're not, then we are compartmentalizing God's character. But he's not like Jekyll and Hyde. He doesn't flip back and forth and catch you off guard. He's all these things at once all the time. We're the Jekyll and Hyde, right? We don't have coffee one day, and I'm off on my kids out of the blue, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm sorry. And that's how we are. That's not how God is. God holds all of these things at all the same time, so he is both transcendent and eminent. They're not really verse. I said verse each other. They're not. It's just understanding the whole fullness of God's character and not picking and choosing what we worship. But today... What's the main character of God that is worshiped today by everybody, even atheists? What is it? Love. God is love. And in fact, it's becoming even more than that. Um, what I'm hearing now is that it isn't just that God is love. He's also holy, but it's, it's that love trumps it. Love trumps every other aspect of God's character. So in other words, if you don't like what God is doing over here, you can just say to yourself, well, he's love, he would never do that. Well, hang on, who are you worshiping at that point? You're worshiping a tiny little idol of a God you made up in your mind. That's not God. We have to worship the totality of who God is. So if you're uncomfortable, see, here's the crazy thing. I actually lean towards God's transcendence. I love power. So I love the idea that God's in control. I need God to be in control. When bad things happen, I lean on that, that God's in control. I got to have God on his throne. If God's off his throne, I want that side of God. If you've ever had an injustice happen in your life, you want the just God. There are martyrs literally in heaven who are waiting, who are crying out, when, when, oh Lord, will you avenge our blood? And he's like, I will Wait a little longer. But man, there are going to be some really surprised people, quote unquote Christians, when Jesus comes back. Because I think he's going to, I think he's going to reveal his full character, right? He came as a servant to serve, to die, to be the sacrificial lamb. I mean, the descriptions in Revelation when he comes back on the, on the horse with his name, on his thigh, king of kings and lord of lords, fire and a sword coming from his mouth, declaring judgment. You know, we're studying Jude right now. I don't know if you noticed this. I, this is not in my thing. I'm going to flip to it real quick. This is the kind of thing I love when you study the word of God. It just reveals things to you, right? Things that we don't realize. We have little, um, like our own biases. But Jude's talking, and he wants to remind these Christians... <laughs> And he says to them, I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. Who? I thought that wrathful God of the Old Testament did that. Jude says, Jesus. You know what else Jesus did? Mm. And the angels who did not stay within their proper position of authority but left their proper dwelling. He, Jesus, pronoun, referring back to the main subject. We haven't had a God in there yet. It's just Jesus. So if you're marking that name, it's Jesus again. Who did it? Jesus. He has kept them in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. That's Jesus. 
Broaden your horizon on who Jesus is. He is not some, only some meek and mild guy who walked around loving on people to the point where he has no ability to also be God. He's both. He's both rescuer, redeemer, faithful, merciful, loving, yes. But how does John describe him? He's grace and truth. He's both. I want to read to you a couple verses that I take great pleasure in. Like, I love these words. These are promises of God that give me comfort. And I hope tonight, if you struggle with worshiping this aspect of God, God's providential control, his sovereign reign, the fact that really, truly, there are times when God brings things into our life we don't want. Not to destroy us, to test us. That is so common through scripture that God tests God tests because he wants the best of us and we learn through suffering and we rely on God through suffering. We don't like it. No one likes suffering. But you you have to wrestle at times in your life. Are you okay if God brought that in under his sovereign control because he wants to draw you in closer and reveal something to you? It's an important thing you should wrestle with. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10 says this. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, there is no other. I am God, there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will accomplish all my purpose. Deuteronomy 32, 39, see now that I, even I, am he. There is no God beside me. I kill, and I make alive. I wound, and I heal. And there is none that can deliver out of my hand. Isaiah 45, 6 and 7, that people may know from the rising of the sun and from the west, there is none besides me. I am Yahweh, and there is no other. I form light and create darkness. I make well-being, and I create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. And then Daniel 2, this is Daniel's own words. After all he's been through, he's still able to say this. Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells in him. We err in worshiping God when we split him in half and only worship one side. We err. Because God has revealed himself so that when we worship him, we worship all of him. Now there is a progressive knowledge, right? We learn more and more. But as we learn, and as he reveals certain aspects of that character to us, even if it makes us uncomfortable, we have to know that that's who God is and we have to worship all of him. And by the way, you know, there's a rule in scripture reading when something's repeated twice, it's important. Like if, if Jesus would say, verily, verily, I say to you, it's like a note, they would perk up and listen because he said it twice. Well, if there's a two times rule, you can imagine that if it's said three times, it's really important, right? So a lot of people want to encompass the fact that all God does flows out of his love. I would say it flows out of his holiness because what are the angels in heaven singing around the throne constantly? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Worthy is he to be praised. Holy, holy, holy. That's God's transcendence. Holiness is set apart, distinguished. Everything God does flows out of his holiness. So when he loves it's out of his holy character. When he justice, when he does judging and just accusations, it's out of his holy character. When he's wrathful towards sin, it's because he's holy. When he's merciful, he's holy. All of it flows out of his holiness. That is who God is. God is holy. Is he love? Absolutely. Absolutely, he's love. But love does not trump God's other characteristics. He can be both at the same time. That's why Jesus said, I'm grace and truth. I understand that this is a little uncomfortable. It was for me when I first read it. But let me tell you, I think if we ever got to experience our world where God was off his throne, 
or if he, if he chose to leave for a time to give us a demo, because let me tell you this, I, I, I believe this, okay? I can't support it biblically, but I, but I believe this. I, I believe that as much as we see evil in this world today, I still believe God is restraining it. I think that if God took his hand off and just let the course play out, I just think it would be an absolute disaster because if evil were ever left unchecked where God was not on his throne, that's not a world I want to be in because we know evil now and we know how bad it can get. But I truly believe with all my heart that God is still actively restraining what is allowed. So we need him on that throne. We want him on that throne. It is so necessary. And how he chooses to do things, I get it. We might not be comfortable. We might be frustrated or confused. I just keep going back to that Isaiah 55. Your ways are not my ways. And, and to even imagine if we were to stand in judgment of God, if we saw something he did, and we were to stand in judgment, and we were to set our own, what we believe to be a merciful nature, up against God's, as if we know how to show mercy better than God, at that point, I'm going to step away from you, because I really, like lightning could come down at any moment. Like, we should never get to the point where we raise ourselves up and puff out our chest and try to measure up, well, I wouldn't have done it that way because I'm merciful. Like, we have to be careful. We have to think rightly and use scripture to make sure that our minds are going, man, I am not God. I don't understand God, but I surrender. And that's, that's the question tonight. Are you able to have a posture of surrender where you go, I don't get everything about it, but I trust you? And really, that's the key question, right? Right? If you're going to be in a relationship with Yahweh, the almighty creator of the world, and be close with him, you have to ask yourself, do I trust him? Once you know him and you know him well, it will lead you to trust him. And when you really feel yourself surrendering in peace to the things that he's doing in your life or in others' life, you will feel love develop. For all of my life, I never understood it when people said I love God because I never felt love. It was only when I began to study God's word and really start to know God for myself, I started feeling a sense of trust develop where I thought, okay, I'm willing to give to this and I'm willing to go, I surrender to that. And as that developed, all of a sudden I began to feel love. And I began to go, I want my, my life in nobody else's hands but yours. I want my kids' lives in nobody else's hands but yours. And I began to have feelings of fear dissipate. Because really, in the face of God, when we worship him in the fullness of his transcendent character as El Elyon, the most high king who sovereignly reigns and rules over everything, it's much easier to lay my head down and go to sleep at night. I told my daughter the other day, I was like, she was upset about something, and I was like, she said, she can't sleep. And I was like, man, you can no more control what's happening in your friend's life than you can the weather. At some point, you got to stop trying to control everything. Open up the hands and let it go and go, I can't do this. We were never meant to carry all the burdens of the world. But isn't it a comfort to know that God can? There are times on staff here, we sit and we have prayer requests. So many times as the list goes longer and longer with, with death and suffering and sickness and pain and divorce and hurt and all these things, and the list keeps getting bigger and bigger, and I, I can literally feel myself getting heavier and heavier and heavier. And then sometimes when I pray, I just stop and I go, you're not even phased by this because this is not heavy to you because you've got all of these. At one time, however many millions upon millions of people can pray. God has never, ever caught off guard, shaken, afraid, worried, overwhelmed. He never has a feeling of being overwhelmed. Nothing is too heavy for him because of his character of being the most high God. He can carry all of it. That's why he constantly has to say to us, you know that thing you gave me? You took it back. 
if you could give it back to me again. It's too heavy for you to carry. And don't we have to do that? Don't we have to consistently keep handing it back to God because we keep trying, well, you're not working fast enough. I'm going to help you. I'm just going to take that bet real quick. And he's like, give it back. <sighs> it's a process. We just keep doing it. But when you worship God like this, I think it should give us comfort. I think this is how we can have the, the kind of peace that transcends understanding because we believe God's on his throne. And we believe with eyes, I don't understand it, but I think he's there, I trust him, he's good. I would want it no other way. Let's pray.